Okay, welcome everyone to the third course, a section of the course from Steve Dowie. Uh, I'm going to uh, go straight to Steve. Um, over to you, Steve. Well, thank you, Alan, for that for that quick introduction. Uh, welcome to part three of the Smart Enough Factory, and it's called, as before, achieving low cost, low skill, and low risk industry 4.0. Uh, perhaps I should just say a little bit about myself. My name is Dr. Steve Dowie. I'm the technology manager at Sutton Tools. I work part-time at RMIT and I'm also the, uh, the founder of the Smart Enough Factory Company. And this is the third part of the short course um, for the EPSRC, Digitalized Surface Manufacturing Network Plus. So without further ado, let's get into it. This is my, uh, you, if you've seen the previous, uh, the previous talks, this is my subtitle. The fact is that low cost, low code and low skill industry 4.0 is actually going to be quite tricky. So perhaps I might have called it how to nail jelly to the wall. But of course, you'll find out the only way to do it is to actually change your jelly. So this is a talk about changing jellies. So, well, actually, and I introduce this in the second, in the second uh, presentation that really uh, the first workshop was why should I try and nail my jelly to the wall? And that was about vision. The second workshop, well, that was what exactly is the jelly that I should be, that I'm going to be talking about, fasting to the wall. And, it, and in fact, it was tools that we could use to actually identify the jelly to stretch the analogy <laughs> as far as it'll possibly go. And that was about identifying the business model. How are we going to identify a business model uh, that we're going to apply our Industry 4.0 vision or our learnings about Industry 4.0 to? And of course, that leads to the final workshop, which is this one. Well, and this one is really about showing you how exactly we're going to nail this jelly to the wall. And really, that's that the key word here is implementation. So we've got a vision. That was our first workshop. Then we looked at our business model, about how to identify it. And finally, in this, in this one, we're going to talk about implementation. And maybe the thing all I can do is show you implementation patterns and um, and actually before we go into the into the into the presentation properly uh, let's talk about what a pattern actually is what I mean what do I mean by pattern um, well here we go here's a design pattern uh, and this is about object oriented programming and I've just highlighted one word in there and that's interface um, look it's actually quite useful um, I, I don't know if this is going to work because I've got, I'm, I'm showing a window here, but uh, when you get a chance, uh, people who are watching, just visit the, the, uh, the web page there. Now I do have it open in a link. It's not going to go there, I don't think. Um, but the reason why I'm suggesting you go and see it is because it does actually have, and of course, you might notice by the, by the text that I'm sharing that it says, it actually says that this section may contain an excessive amount of intricate detail that may interest only a particular audience. So that's an interesting thing. It's the first time I see that in, Wiki in Wikipedia, but uh, yeah, it's worth it for a laugh because I think very, very few people will want to look at design patterns in terms of object-oriented programming, but they actually are quite useful. Uh, you have patterns. There are also things like anti-patterns. And just as a, uh, a bit of a, a light-hearted uh, aside, um, it's maybe worth having a look at some of those organizational anti-patterns. I, I, de I deleted the, uh, the, the, the definitions, but I think we can all work out what Siegel management is, perhaps what mushroom management is, and um, design by committee. And there's a lot of things about anti-patterns. So anti-patterns are things you should avoid, and patterns are things you should do. And of course, here's a well-known pattern. And of course, like all patterns, you have to actually be well-versed in the, in the sort of shorthand for these things. That's a knitting pattern. And then you might think, well, actually, you might have talked about frameworks. Is a framework just a pattern? And is it like a scaffold? Well, a bit like digitalization and digitization. Let's not go, get hung up about definitions. The point is, when I say pattern, perhaps I really just should say I'm going to show you some examples. OK, so here's a summary of this presentation. The too long didn't read part of it. So we need to move from our vision to a business model, to an implementation. And we saw that digitalization is the precursor to Industry 4.0. And our version of Industry 4.0, what, we, what we've chosen to define it as, uh, we're, we're, our Industry 4.0 adoption 
it enables this vision or concept of rapid actions that can minimize the cost associated with delaying those actions. And, and really it's about minimizing the loss due to an event occurring. And when I talk about that, I'm really focusing on events in a production system. And we'll see later on, and if you recall from the previous presentations that we can look at industry 4.0, either internally with inside a company or externally. Externally, it's typically our products and internally it's typically our processes. And we're gonna focus on productivity when it's internal and compliance. And that's something that doesn't necessarily come up in the, um, in the uh, definitions that you might see, but I think productivity and compliance go hand in hand. And we've established that digitalization, it needs a, stra needs a strategy. And this is an operational technology strategy as well as an information technology strategy. And that goal, and that goal, of course, is productivity and compliance. And we highlighted this digital triangle and about the smart enough strategy. And so we talked last time about being opinionated, about getting an opinion on, on things. And so an opinion is essentially a, a shorthand for a framework. We're going to use a framework and we're going to have a solution driven journey and uh and that means we have to identify a real business problem uh technical problems yeah very interesting but it's got to be of value to the business and, and that gets highlighted like, over and over again um and like i say it should be technology driven so this is the how so how do you implement a smart enough i 4.0 solution to a real business problem and you do it by understanding the digitalization of your own processes. And this is the point about you. You need to get opinionated on what will give you or your company bang for buck. So, and finally, we're going to cover this, what we can do with one bit. And this is what our final workshop's about essentially. And of course, what do I mean by one bit? Well, here's a little, little sketch. We have a bit and it varies from zero to one and it does it over a period of time. And uh, that's all there is to it. And we'll start to look at what we can do with that later on. So let's look at the how in the presentation. So this is the overview of what we're gonna do in this presentation, really. We're gonna just quickly recap the why of Industry 4.0, and we're gonna use those architect maturity stages that we talked about and presented. And we're gonna also recap the what we want to do and how we could identify a business model. We'll do that relatively quickly. We'll just refresh our minds about the implementation guidelines and this concept of maturity indexes. And maturity indexes are quite important actually. They actually give value for a, a business in ensuring that there's a common language and a common definition uh, and measures for estimating the effect of something. So don't underestimate those things, especially if you're working at a, at a, at a, a level where you're sort of you know, very hands-on in a business or in, in research. Uh, if you step back and look at the bigger picture, you really want to measure potentially success. And you also want everyone to be brought along on the same journey. So that's one of the things that maturity indexes help to do. Okay, so the how. Of course, there are many ways. And what we're gonna look at is a visibility aspect, which of course is stage one of industry 4.0, if we've been looking at our VDMA, or sorry, our Apotec uh, maturity indexes. Uh, we're going to talk about the smart enough way at certain tools. We're going to talk about the factory in a box. And interesting, the smart enough good project, which is obviously a pun. And then we'll finish with a live demo. So let's let's start. So recall that we want to get value from industry 4.0. And that's a big message and it's and it's a continuous and a constant message. Um, remember that we said that 60% uh, of businesses in Australia, so there's no value in IoT and IoT, uh, Internet of Things, or if you're looking at the states, it's the industrial Internet of Things, which is actually their industry 4.0, the IIoT organization is their, essentially their industry 4.0 organization in the states. I um, apologize for my phone beeping away. Uh, uh, it might happen more and more. <laughs> There's no clear value to digitalization. That's the other, other thing that's an issue. And it's not your core business typically. Uh, we have this simplified model. I'll quickly populate it. We think of the enterprise as these triangles 
and they actually are our multi-level production systems. Uh, they make product, in this case a poking machine, a, a washing machine, a tractor, and traditionally data flows through our enterprise. Uh, but this, this vision of Industry 4.0, what is it? Well, Industry 4.0 talks about connecting vertically and horizontally these, these enterprises into value chains, or the, the, that's the creation of these value chains. And ultimately, that's it. That's what Industry 4.0 is. <clears throat> and it's expected to be here in about 2030. We can do a lot now, and that's what we're trying to show. And the point is that people... People interact with these enterprises, the, with the production systems and with the products. And data now flows out of the enterprise to the products uh, and via the cloud or via some networking magic, um, we have a connection of, of these various enterprises and it's often defined as being something very complex. Now, whether a complex is complicated is another story, but there we go. Um, and that's that vision in, in uh, with the red highlights, essentially, that it's about um, this full integration of cyber physical production systems. You've got intelligent products, intelligent machines, and systems, and they're all securely connected, and they're all and it's based on common standards. They all independently communicate and they cooperate with each other over the entire manufacturing process. And the last little sentence there, all with minimal or no computer intervention, or no human intervention, I should say. A uh, bit of a slip of the tongue there with computer intervention. But that the point of that is that's 2030. Prior to that, all things, there's a lot we can achieve without that final, that final step. And that's here. This is that final step, this adaptability, this concept of autonomous response of systems. We're not there yet. And in fact, I'm going to focus in these areas. Um, where we talk about digitalization has been the first precursor step to industry 4.0 but of course you don't just digitalize your systems for nothing you typically would do that to get some visibility and really that visibility step that first step is where we're going to focus on and actually once you have some visibility it's almost well depending on the type of business and type of data that you're going to make visible the predictive capacity can be extremely trivial and that's where the use and the concept of the smart enough factory comes in <clears throat> all right value creation very quickly this is this is a graph that architect used to show why uh industry 4.0 has value to a company here is an event an event occurs and it takes time it takes time before we see what happened in fact, it's, it's almost like it takes time before the event is actually visible. Then it takes time to analyze the problem. Then it takes time to create a countermeasure. And then it takes time to, for that to take effect. So there's all these latencies. And this, is, this concept is a standard corporate decision-making and adaptation process. So it's quite long-winded. Um, but the point is with Industry 4.0 that what Industry 4.0 does is reduces those latencies. So here we have the same latencies, but they're much more reduced. So all of the, the when an event occurs to when the countermeasure takes place, you don't lose too much value. That's the aim. So it's, it's reducing the amount of value lost, which is a bit counterintuitive. You'd like to pick, you'd like to pick up, pick up and potentially make more, have more benefit than just that, but that's potentially how they describe it. And they describe the, the parts of, the elements that are going to give these reduction in latencies, and I'll highlight the latencies, we have this insight one. For insight, it says real-time capability. Now, I would suggest that we also need uh, to have um, that concept, and these are those maturity stages, uh, computerization and connectivity uh, are here, but, um, but I actually think that the reality is that this, when you look at visualization, a real-time capability without visualization and without cyber physical systems will mean that we're not going to get that. So essentially, the again, this points the first sort of model or that first step of visualization has been something that we want to try and achieve. And that will have 
a tremendous effect in reducing at least the first stage. And if we notice the curves shallower here uh, of losses. So that's why we, that's how we can define value for industry 4.0. That's why we would do it. And that brings you to this. This is a new slide. And this, it's worth following these links. This is about, a, this is a, a report from uh, Deloitte Access or Deloitte Industry or Deloitte Insights, I should say, because uh, Deloitte's a big, big company. And this is actually talking about different paradoxes. And there's a whole series of these paradoxes. Um, and that boils down to sort of a company saying it wants to do something, uh, but then when it comes to looking at how much they're going to spend on it, so they're not going to spend anything on it. So those, that's what these paradoxes are about. And so this is a strategy paradox. And, uh, and it's about leaders of companies and they understand that it can be, that it can aid strategic growth. So that's this, this top point here. But they talk about more operate, about operational improvements now um, than revenue growth. And that's a little bit like I was highlighting before that, that in some respects, that's just mirroring the, the value option that, that, that architect promise that we're not talking about growth above that we're talking about reducing you know improving our operations we're not pushing that curve higher we're not increasing value um and i think that's that's a that's a bit of a fallacy but any, anyway i would again encourage you to read that part and to follow this to follow these links um but the highlight here is it says that 94 percent of respondents agreed that it's a digital transformation is a top strategic priority. But then when it comes to putting money into it, they're going to invest an average of about 30% of their operational IT budget on digital transformation initiatives, but only 11% of their R&D budget on this on the, on the side. And then when it comes to about profitability, it talks about that these technologies, i.e. these investments, whether they're going to be critical to maintaining proper ability, 68% uh, agreed with that. Now that's still above above 50, but it's actually when, this, when they ask the CEOs the same questions, only 50% of the CEOs indicated the importance of a digital transformation to maintaining profitability. So yes, that's actually, there's a lot of negative factors why, why um, companies don't uh, invest what they can do into industry 4.0. The other figure on the right hand side is is actually quite interesting too. Um, it's also it's a question. What tools and technologies are you currently using to access, analyze, and leverage the data from your assets? And the people who responded to the to this, it's mainly they mainly still using the same old, same old spreadsheets, data management systems, and the ERP software analysis. Now the color code and, and less less of them are looking at CMM systems or cloud computing capabilities. And down here, advanced simulation and modeling, not many people are doing that. They're not using many video tools or robotic process automation. Interestingly, that's quite low down on the list. And then where we are, sensorization, that's essentially, I think, where I'd say the factory in a box and the smart enough factory are working. And that's down here. Now, interestingly, they're colored. They say that indicates greater focus on legacy upgrades versus the relatively newer tool sets. So sensorization, we're talking about sensorization potentially of legacy systems. And that's what the smart enough factory concept is looks at. It does focus on legacy upgrades. And the reason for that is that the investment required is huge for to change your production systems. And potentially uh, that's the that's a that's a a negative on digital growth. And the idea is if we can add, if we can add digital functionality to, to existing systems, then we can sort of shortcut their sort of asset replacement life cycle and actually apply digitalization techniques onto legacy or, or existing equipment to actually get the benefit of industry 4.0 now. And that's where we, we're trying to go with a smart enough concept. So smart enough versus smart. Okay. So let's look at in the, in the establishment of the industry for business case. We'll quickly look at maturity indexes. We covered that in, in, in fairly much in, in depth, but I just want to just highlight them again. Um, 
and I'm going to do that in that concept of the SME requirements for a maturity index. And I'm going to just highlight that we really need to keep it simple. So that's a keep it simple, stupid. That's the KISS principle. And we've seen on the left, we've seen that uh, the stages of Industry 4.0, and, and uh, I spent quite a bit of time uh, essentially sort of saying that this is a great model. Um, this this uh, staged approach to Industry 4.0, where value, according to Akatek, is actually created at each of these ones. I did uh, talk about whether zero should be around here, you know, that, that those things are all sort of sunk costs. They should maybe be below the line. But that's it. So we have value increasing as we, but the point is, of course, that we looked at visibility. That's the first step of industry 4.0, truly. Um, and then predictive capacity. What's on the right is a model of a business. Now, I like the left hand side. I like figure six, but I don't like figure seven. Figure seven represents the measure that uh, the architect developed to create a maturity index. And it, it runs over to over 70 questions, each one, each of those questions with, say, multiple stages. And it talks about the corporate processes, you know, having these functional areas as well as a corporate structure. So each of those functional areas, like production, also has a structural areas, which can be broken down into the resources there, the information systems, the culture in that section, and also the organizational structure within that section. And that all leads to creating this, this, uh, this axis questions that uh, on these two principles that try and establish where you are in that ring where the sixth level is this adaptability level very complex and in fact it's so complex that in 2017 uh fraunhofer the fraunhofer iff uh, published a, 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 a paper in a, com a conference essentially uh, looking at how in, uh, SMEs uh, use or what they require from maturity models. And the figure on the right, I have no idea uh, how it's derived. They don't say that in the page, but what they do say is it is a cost utility analysis. So it's some measure of, well, it's cost versus some measure of utility. And the point is that what they say is that none of the existing models meets the need needs of SMEs. So essentially what the SMEs reported on these models was that none of them actually had any utility or a large amount of utility versus the cost. And what this paper or this, uh, this, this conference paper proposed was, um, well, they identified the requirements for SMEs for such a maturity index and they proposed doing a, 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 a low one for that. So let's just let me put my phone on silence because I seem to be getting lots and lots of emails this time of night, which I didn't expect to be doing. And that should no longer interrupt me. Okay, so what they look for, SMEs would look for um, essentially a, a model or an index that would actually wouldn't cost them too much to do. And it wouldn't take them much time to do either one that would incorporate their own objectives, one that would actually give them significant re results. And it was, uh, they are saying that they would want support to interpret the results. I'll just highlight that one. Uh, and some development, and it would allow them to independently develop actions, as in, you know, once you've identified some sort of uh, maturity level, how do you actually move, move it? And maturity indexes are often, uh, the reason why I'm talking about maturity indexes, they're often coupled with identifying uh, or perhaps that's what SMEs think they're for, is to identify an area to to actually uh, look at um, look at improvement that is going to lead them to some Industry 4.0 outcome. And they don't need any specialised knowledge. That's what they would love. And we highlighted that uh, actually there are a couple online, and this is, for example, this VDMA readiness model, which I could in, you could actually do yourselves uh, to actually uh, work out where you were in relation to the other companies that have done uh, these these checks, and it breaks down your um, skill level, level zero to level five, um, amongst your peers, and it and it does that over a, a number, maybe fifteen or so different uh, areas of your enterprise or your business. Uh, that's not the only one. There's another one here from 
uh, the Industrial Internet Consortium. As I said, this is the American version, the IIoT, as opposed as opposed to Industry 4.0. And one thing I want to highlight, and again, they look at business strategy, business solutions, the technology and security. And in technology, they talk about a platform stack. And that's essentially in these architectures and standards. And this is the area in the technology area that, that this presentation is actually about. So that's how it all fits together with these maturity indexes and what have you. Um, one thing we did identify was this one. We did like this, or I encourage you to, to look at that. And we, we, we used it to, uh, everyone should have downloaded it and, uh, and looked at this. Uh, and actually, I think it's one that's that's relatively straightforward to adopt. It splits up your products and your production, which I don't necessarily agree with, but that's okay. That's what it does. And that's because of the legacy that Industry 4.0 in Germany has. That's, um, and that legacy is actually visible in here. For example, this triangular shape. Remember we, we talked about the, we showed, I showed you the enterprise as a triangle. When you see that, you'll recognize the enterprise. Now we'll look at this again but last time we talked about using this as a tool of, of locating where you are, let's just say everything that you can do or describe about your production system is down here, then you're not very far along this industry 4.0 journey. You can see this triangle at the top gets fatter to the right. This is industry four, industry four Nirvana down this side. If you're all in this, in this, if you can say that, okay, my, my systems, my data processing in the production is all automatic process planning and control. I can sit there with my feet up. That's the concept. So we'll come back to that later. And then on the left hand side, it's products. These are industry 4.0 products. And just to just to highlight this, this is, this is the product. It's a box product X. And you can see how product X appears in the pictures and how product X has some autonomy and can do things and independently do stuff and interact with other things. And that's what goes on. So that's these that's describing a product that is an industry 4.0 product in itself. And the right is an industry 4.0 production system. Okay, again, the tri again with the triangle, just wanna reinforce this. And because it comes in, it's because it's, because it's embedded in the definitions in Germany. Um, and the concept is that, um, you know, that there's a hierarchy of the business um, and there's a hierarchy of, of, of essentially software uh, and systems. So there's business planning and logistics at this level four, and they're sort of site-wide or enterprise-wide. Then within the manufacturing zone itself, you've got these manufacturing execution systems down here. And then finally down the bottom, you have PLCs and what have you and control systems. And again, just to highlight that what happened with industry 4.0 is that this layer on the top, the cloud that we drew before is a connected world and the products that pop out the bottom are field devices and products. And that's the extension of this model. Notice the year um, to now to <clears throat> this industry 4.0 model. So it's an extension above and below or um, between enterprises. So out to the products and between other enterprises. <clears throat> And that's essentially, again, it's another view of Industry 4.0, but from the big player's perspective. <clears throat> now we're going to get into the, into the, into the, into the, into the how. So we've got a, a dashboard. This is a smart enough factory dashboard. This is a one, this is a, a live screenshot from Sutton Tools at some point in the past. And it's got some information on it. It's a visualization board of data from machines. There's a the machine name is on the top there. Just uh, we, we go into this a bit more detail, but essentially the, these are these are the machines, and then this is the current shift, and then the previous shift is at the bottom. Okay, so if we were to identify. Um, now, I, I also, and uh, we tried to do some interactive things last time, so it's not, it might not work <laughs> and you might all be muted. So perhaps I'll actually have to be the, your interactive person for, for the, uh, 
for the day and maybe ask myself these questions. Um, but so so let's see. I think I think no one can use their mics, but let's just uh, let let me let me do the talking. Okay. So where does this sit? Where does a a visualization factory board sit? Now, actually, it's, it's fairly straightforward. If we look around here, <clears throat> there's a picture of a graph, and that happens to be in our data processing in the production in production. So we're in the production line. Uh, and we can say that we're analyzing data for process monitoring. So these are our processes we're monitoring them. But perhaps we could also argue that we're starting to evaluate the data here for process planning and control. And this, this picture doesn't show it, but that we, because we know our stopped time per shift, we can work out our utilization of these machines. So we can see the utilization and we can see potentially, so I'll just, what I'm highlighting is this, this stop time, whatever, and, and there's no time at the moment, but this, at this point in the shift, this machine was stopped for 20 minutes. Whereas a previous shift, it was stopped for an hour and 13. This has been stopped for six minutes so far in the shift, but in the previous shift in total, it was stopped for three hours and 21 seconds. It had a target of 11, 1,150, but only made 731. Um, so there's some information in there. We can use this information. Uh, we can look at utilization, for example, we can look at how far off the target we were all the time to either modify the target or modify what we put through or require of our equipment if we if this target is true for example the, the, this this hill um and that right now if it stays going we're only gonna we're gonna actually miss the target hence this amber indicator um then we might look at our target so that's why i put this dash line here that perhaps we're actually are beginning to use this information for evaluation and for process planning but what about the support? Um, let's see, I think if I can get uh, a drawing tool, maybe I maybe I'll just maybe I'll just indicate with my mouse. The point is that where else would we need? What enabling tech would we need in order to create this? Now, if we've got a conventional factory, perhaps we can't have no communication between our machines. We actually need our machines somehow to be networked. Now, whether we have industrial ethernet interfaces or the machines have access to the internet, then you can see that just this one simple board is going to require some form of machine to machine communication perhaps. It might also require as well, something in this line here, which is about company wide networking with, within the production we might need to have some, uh, at least some information, data formats and rules for data exchange. We might actually actually need to have, now it says interdivisionally linked data servers. So we actually need, but we need some form of data exchange, whether it's not necessarily interdivisionally, it's maybe within the system. Perhaps we can ignore this one and look at ICT infrastructure in production, that we need essentially at least data servers in production if we're going to do to get data like this perhaps um we well this man machine interface essentially this is a man machine interface so in some respects it's also an interface that's telling us information about the machines and it's perhaps even here look centralized decentralized production monitoring control so it's not only a visualization tool for production, it's also here as well. It's also a centralized, decentralized monitoring and control system. Now, I think the only one that it doesn't touch is potentially this, this concept of efficiency of batches. We're going to get information about our batches, um, but it's not a factory layout or concept of that. So, but I like to say, I'd like to try and emphasize that that perhaps to actually do this requires not only the building of the dashboard, but it requires a lot more supporting infrastructure 
than perhaps you maybe thought of in order to actually enable it. But that's where the smart enough concept comes in. Um, and this is it. This is the smart enough factory expressed in terms of this ISA 95. So another way of looking at this ISA 95 in terms of the levels is to look at the software that's, in a, that's used in those levels. We have an enterprise resource planning system here, a manufacturing execution system here. We have a, a SCADA, which is supervisory control and data acquisition system here. If you think of watching people, uh, Cadbury's or uh, working in mines, they, you know, where people sit in front of a large bank of screens and they can see a visualization of the entire plant. That's typically a SCADA system. HMI, human machine interface. That'll be a interface that's on a machine. And that HMI and SCADA systems typically interact with PLCs. And then the PLCs interact with sensors and signals. So this is the, this is the concept of data flowing through an organization, which is why there's that arrow up and down throughout the organization in the first, in that first figure about industry 4.0. There is an interesting thing here in terms of the time scale. This is also really important to have an awareness of that in at the level of the production process, we might have to do some really careful control of over timings in the micro millisecond level here. Now, uh, PLCs, a little bit slower in the seconds and in the minutes. Now, we're making connections to these systems. And we're going to do that through our smart enough factory concept here. So the smart enough factory concept here is this blue section on the, on the bottom left. And what it does is provide the person on the left with information to feed back into the system. So there's, it's not a closed loop system. And there's a good reason for that. This is the fact is that if we want to do our jelly nailing, we have to modify the jelly. If we want low cost and low code and low risk industry 4.0, we really want to do this. And this is because we don't want to interrupt our system here. We also find that in an organization, these layers might not be present. You might not have a dedicated manufacturing execution system. You might not have a control system. You might just monitor, or you might just have a HMI on your machines. You might not have a, a dedicated ERP system. You might be just be using a spreadsheet to manage your business, and lots of businesses do. Even successful small businesses don't necessarily you know, or, or can plan on and do successfully plan using just just uh, a spreadsheet and perhaps just office products. And in fact, all of those sections can be missing. Yet we can still enable the smart enough factory concept. And that's because we overlay the missing bits. That's the key. So how to, can we do it? We overlay the missing parts with some lightweight wireless sensor network that's, that potentially could be redundant if we looked at using or integrating deeply into the existing hardware. But that's what we're trying to avoid is doing that. So this is the concept of the smart enough factory. And that's what makes it, it attractive. It's low cost and it doesn't interfere with the existing systems if they exist at all. So I'll just quickly go back and just remind ourselves here. So if we have that in our heads that really the things that we were miss that that we thought we needed as precursors let's just try and show that that we thought we would need to have either some ethernet or access or some access to the internet we actually provide those things with the factory in a box so we collect data from the machines via a separate network it doesn't require well within the within the the smart enough concept in the factory in a box, we do use uniform data formats and rules. But this here, we don't require company wide networking. We don't require central database servers makes it nice if we've got them because the point is that we provide our own with the factory in a box concept. And again, 
I think man machine interface is the fact is that this is a man machine interface. So in, in, in some respects that, you know, this arrow here, this is what we're doing. We could actually have drawn an arrow down to here as well, um, where we're talking about this production control. So just recall that we want, that's what we're going to do. So how do we do it? We've talked about the whys a lot and, and, and giving you some examples. But the concept of this, of course, is we want to do it for all organizations, not just automated manufacturers. We're doing it from a small company perspective. And we've got this focus on digitalization. So let's just remind ourselves smart enough. What does it mean? We've seen this before, but we're going to focus on digitalization and productivity. We're going to be looking at management data. It's going to be driven by management data. That's how we're going to focus on productivity. We're going to do it through that. We want, we want to make our processes, we want them to be transparent, and we want to see things immediately. It's pretty much lean manufacturing, to be quite honest. And we're going to leave control and the actions to the experts and the expert system. So that's it. That's why we're not looking at high cost, real time. We're looking at near real time, best effort information, because we're not trying to keep these tightly controlled feedback loops automated that's that's all looked after in the process and we're going to close our loop but we're using the operator the manager we're actually empowering them to do these things um the triangle is an interesting one um we did talk about this before but it's the joiner triangle and um the joiner triangle was a as, as a tool it's actually an organizational structure as well as just this this concept um and there the highlighted things there are the ones in italics and that was of course the concept was that everyone wants to be in this should be in the same team so all singing from the same hymn sheet would be a saying that might come to mind there we would use the scientific approach in order to determine we would you know make observations on our systems and to ensure that you know what that we are based our decisions on on a site on the scientific method and we would be doing it because we want to focus on quality and the point of the triangle concept is that if we miss one of the corners then, we, then the whole thing falls down. So this is a digital concept. So the really the, the digital equivalent of being in one team is having a single source of truth. Now, that doesn't mean to say just one database, it could be multiple databases, but the point would be that you don't repeat yourselves. Um, you don't have multiple stores. You have a single store and you access that store through services. Uh, to be quite honest, the data-driven management approach is actually the same as a scientific one. We're going to rely on data from the, from the system to make decisions. And we're going to do it because we're going to focus on productivity and compliance. And productivity and compliance are both aspects of quality because we want to produce quality product. And compliance to quality standards, they, those standards could be internal standards or they could be external standards for our customers further down this or further up or down this sort of value chain. Um, so what is management data? It's the simple stuff. And this is where we come into the concept of managing just bits of information and how they're valuable. So the simple stuff that managers and supervisors want to know about is what their machines are doing. Are they, what, what state are they in? They don't necessarily need to know what what RPM the motor is, or the, the what level of vibrations on at that particular point, or, uh, or or some very esoteric sort of internal system process. They really want to know the basic information that it's idle, busy, that it's on or off, and uh, potentially this data that we're going to collect, we can use it to support things like um, and the manual process in interventions, which is essentially um, the, the the computerized uh, maintenance systems and maintenance and management systems for machines. Uh, if we want to know operating hours, it would be something very trivial to, to log using a system such as a smart enough factory concept to log runtime, real runtime. Um, and we could also use it uh, to interact with a system, you know, with a touch screen here, um, with the ability to, to enter fields, we can actually report faults and we might have uh, we might have a series of smiley faces or, you know, a list of five top faults that we have. And if there's a breakdown, we can actually very quickly pick the, the box that represents a breakdown and associate that with the fault with very little intervention. And of course, we've talked about this, about forecasting. 
um, and that's achieving targets. And we can also look at machine utilization. And utilization is one, there's a concept of overall equipment effectiveness and availability is just one aspect of that. And that's essentially utilization. You know, is the machine available to work? Um, productivity is the next level. You know, how much has it, how many parts or things has it made? Or how much of that uptime was useful? And then the last one is like the quality aspect of it. Have those parts that we've made, have they, are they actually to specification? The other thing we can look at is assets. We can, we can track assets and we can, why would we want to track assets when we have systems that exist already? Well, perhaps even if you have a, a, a an ERP system, uh, you actually may, you may not um, know exactly where parts are because often with an ERP system, um, there's work in progress and, um, and the sign off stages are not necessarily the last that, that you know, that they aren't, they aren't necessarily spaced out at every single machine. There might be sections that something goes through. And so we can identify whips, uh, work in progress, queues and bottlenecks. If we look at asset tracking as well. So we're going to do a little bit of a, a deeper dive as we get on and, and show some examples. Uh, but this is again the dashboard. And so what's this what's this dashboard elements that we talked about before? Well, we identify the machines. This is a machine identification here. Um, it identifies the instantaneous. Now, this is near real time information. And we're actually using two bits rather than one to, to derive this busy state and this stop state here. Uh, oh, this, this, it's in some intermediate state here. Um, we have a target. Oh, sorry, we have a, a cycle time. That happens to be moving average cycle time for that particular, for the job. We have a target for the shift or for a time period that this we're looking at for this, this display. Um, we have the current shift total. We have a forecast total. And uh, we can actually then use that to see how we track how are we tracking to our target and we can do that this is the forecasting this is looking looking forward so early in the shift we can look forward to the end of the shift and predict and model how many parts we like to make and we can do that because it's essentially a very trivial sort of curve fitting sort of uh function that we can do that if we've made so many parts within a certain time and we've got a certain time left if we carry on at the same rate we can actually make those parts so that's it it's a very very simple model um, if we then look here we can also look at downtime oops move forward there downtime is actually fairly straightforward to look at as well if we tot up all the times that we're stopped this one's been down for seven minutes in the previous shift this was down for an hour etc cetera, etc cetera. and then once we're once we're armed with this stop time we can then look at utilization or this availability that in the particular shift of eight hours or whatever it was down for one hour so that was allows us to make a to make a a, a fraction or express it as a percentage if we maybe look at asset tracking and we'll see this one in practice it gives us our instantaneous location of an asset here for example we have this job which although i've left them all as undefined it's just a job that's in this area we call welding so it allows us to visualize the work in progress which is these stacked bars at these particular locations if we look at this figure on the right hand side we can see that we can see when things started at a particular location if there's no end date we can say that it's there and that's when it arrived if it uh, if it's left the area we have an end date we can see a duration potentially and um and that's it so this is a very handy way of visualizing your work in progress um we can monitor the time at station and if we check these on and check these off there's going to be gaps between something be going from fabrication to NDT or welding or whatever we have as the headings 
and we can look at the time between stations. So that's travel time. Um, so what type of assets can we look at? Well, we can identify uniquely jobs, people or parts, for example. And this is a, the, just a little bit of a, an emphasis before that the locations are not necessarily aligned with the production stages, um, you know, or the, or the sign offs in your enterprise resource planning system, but uh, all the other other jobs, but that's something we do asset tracking. Um, so let's talk about the factory in a box. Um, the factory in a box, what it has is the same hardware and the same software that was used at the Sutton Tools plant uh, for the, and, and in their visual factory. And this is a picture of the first prototype. The first prototype was pretty James Bond. We've got a TV. I always wanted a TV inside a, inside a briefcase. So that's, uh, we've got a briefcase there uh, with the monitor on the inside of it. And we have uh, the um, parts presented to the user, the operator, uh, all in sep all separated out to be pulled out and assembled and uh, and connected. And the reason for having them all separate is to try and emphasize that this this hardware could be then applied in a real factory. Um, it's completely open for modification and it uses open source tools and the tools that we'll see later on and node red we'll have a bit of a deeper dive into node red when we look at the demo system we won't really look at the database too much uh, we'll talk about the arduinos that we use in fact you if you're into arduinos you'll see that the original prototypes here were on uh, were, were done with um uh megas and the newer ones, we have our own dedicated ASTM32 boards, but yeah, it was just a shield that we built. In fact, I can show the prototype sort of here. Just hiled it up to the, the light. So yeah, there's a mega underneath that one. And the same devices that we've got on the factory floor, sort of attached, attached here, so these nodes. So, that was all fine and dandy, but what it meant was that um, uh, it was actually difficult to sort of set up, and um, you ended up with a tech, with a desktop full of wires and what have you. But the point was that it was deployable, and you could t turn it from being a teaching tool to an actually an operational tool, um, and you could engage with it in multiple different ways. So you could modify it. It was completely open to modify and configure it yourselves, and it's got a quite a lot of different levels of engagement with the users so you can either look at it and, look and say oh that's very pretty that's great um, and you can uh, understand what's going on in the in the concept of the process or the factory that you're simulating um, but you can also dive a lot deeper and I'll show that that uh, that later and the concept was that it was it, it didn't cost a great deal to engage with and there was very little risk of engagement so it's something that students in fact uh, a lot of students helped with the the setup of this system and the testing of it, uh, but it allowed us, um, and the and the basic system was used to work out how to deploy and create a a, a a dashboard without actually getting on the floor until until we actually needed to get on the floor to do it. Now the second version, Fire version two, Fire version two is actually, I think, the most obvious one that it's a factory that it is a factory in a box. The concept here was to try and give us a live schematic, a bit like Mythbusters. A myth, if I can say Mythbusters, at this time of night. Um, and it sort of tried to sort of do the things about cable management. And essentially left everything set up on the board, so it was just a matter of plugging it in and turning it on. And it's pretty open. There's no covers or cases on anything, and we can sort of see that there's a factory outline on the board. So this is the factory. And it's a factory in a box, in a box. Um, and here we have some machines, some simulated machines. There's two in this particular case, and these two simulated machines are running a process. They both happen to be in the, the run state and in cycle as well. If they're, in fact, yes, they're both running and they're both in cycle. So this is a light tower 
Um, and they can be linked together. In fact, in this particular case, you can actually see that the output of this one is going to the input of that one, and the output of that one is going to the input of this one. So we can look at it as a little production system. And the data acquisition nodes here are definitely separated from the machines and connected just by wires. So they could be removed from the board and fitted the machine. And again, here, we see that these wireless devices here, little wireless sort of symbols, are talking by 802.15.4. They, they could be talking via Bluetooth or via Zigbee, depending on the sort of the, the type of these devices here. But essentially, the, we, we tend to stick to 802.15.4. And they communicate those two here, fab one and fab two, communicate with fab zero here, that's on this Raspberry Pi. So this Raspberry Pi here, hopefully a little ring will have appeared, is an edge computer. And so this, this is our edge device. This is on the this sits on the edge of our network. It sits on the on the edge of two net, it sits actually between two networks. So the these devices, Fab Zero, Fab One, and Fab Two, form their own wireless network that's not an 802.11. It's not a Wi Fi network. It's a different type of network. It won't interfere with the Wi Fi network. And this, the, the Pi, which is running a minimal amount of software, uses this Wi Fi connection to the cloud essentially, which is a just a, a dongle here, a modem, and then off out to, to wherever it's used. Um, it's actually easy to visualize the operation, but it's harder to modify. Um, we could use the old one to determine the range and things like that. Now that evolved finally to this. Um, so same, same idea, two devices, the board is the factory, the case is a little bit prettier but that allows it to be uh, a lot smaller and to fit into these uh, into these travel cases and inside the travel case is actually a, a Chromebook um, so it goes to one Raspberry Pi uh, and a Chromebook on this particular one there would be still a requirement for maybe a, a, a second computer uh, to run the uh, to to to, this, to to be used as a server for the web pages and possibly a server for the database. So two Raspberry Pis. This one combines everything together. Same deal. Um, and this is what it's for. What's the point of it? it it's actually for this industry 4.0 capability enhancement and learning. And uh, it's going to be it assists us in the problem of converting data to knowledge. And this is what's missing <clears throat> in some respects because companies make products or pro or carry out processes and they're very well versed in those products and processes that's their bread and butter but they're not necessarily used to generating data and so rather than having a, a real a real system that generates some data this is a, a a simulated system that generates lots of data that allows then the user of this system to uh work out how to turn that data into knowledge and if you're in the uk which um which you are of course uh this word here might ring a few bells it's a shoestring approach to industry 4.0 so that that it does follow that shoestring approach and this is what's actually in the box this is a schematic of the of the of the hardware um and we'll note that um, on the right hand side down here, we have got a, we happen to have some a machine with a module. We happen to have a kettle here with a module and some sort of indicator with a module as well. Then we have this green box, which represents our Raspberry Pi. And that has a USB type dongle in there, as well as an Ethernet or Wi Fi connection. And we can look at this as our Chromebook, or as our laptop. And so inside the Raspberry Pi, what's actually on the Raspberry Pi? Well, the Raspberry Pi actually runs uh, a whole series of, it runs everything. It's got all the software on it. Now, these would typically be split apart in a production system, but a 
Raspberry Pi is capable of having everything on here at the moment. And so it has Node-RED. It has a MQTT broker called Mosquito. It has a database administration tool, and it has a Postgres real-time database. As I say, this, this is likely to be distributed in practice. So in practice, uh, an industrial application here would just have the Node-RED MQTT publisher. Oops, giving the game away. Um, so that's the schematic of the factory in a box. And the laptop is possibly through an optional router, um, actually shows the database. And uh, the data is using the an MQTT protocol. Now MQTT is a message queue and transfer protocol. And it uses a concept of a publish and subscribe one. And we'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but uh, essentially, I'll talk about it this way. If you subscribe to a to a magazine or a newspaper, show my age now. If you get if, if you still get a newspaper delivered, you won't go to the newspaper publisher. You won't have a client server relationship with the with the with the newspaper. You will actually go through your news agent, and the news agent acts as a broker between you and the publisher. So you, as a subscriber, would would uh, tell a news agent that you wanted a a copy of a certain magazine or a certain paper, and they would work out ordering it from the printer or the news their, their agent, and they would look after everything. The publisher of the New York Times, Washington Post, or the Grimsby Herald, or whatever it is, or the would not need to know you at all. They would tend to have. You know, they might not even publish another extra newspaper. They'll just have an aggregate. So that's it. So this broker is a very useful thing. It splits out the relationship or splits apart the relationship between essentially the publisher and the subscriber. And that's really, really useful. And what it means is that the devices like this, if they use this MQTT protocol, you can potentially have a separate broker on another server on the network. And all it does is sort of register itself with the broker and it publishes and that's all it does it just sits there and publishes then at some other point another machine might subscribe and it subscribes via a topic again we'll come into that a little bit later on but that's it and the reason for showing you this is that um interestingly uh this is all containerized they're all docker containers that's on this uh, that's on node red sorry it's on the raspberry pi and that allows a very very simple way of splitting apart these different functions, these different applications. And in and essentially on the Pi itself, each one of those is not aware of the other unless we deliberately allow them to be. And they are separated from the operating system, but we do have to pass through the USB signal to the to node red. And we do have to make sure that they, uh, the, net, the network bridge can of the, of the devices can talk either between themselves on their own internal network or across out to the rest of the wide world. Now, I want to just take a few minutes to talk about this. And this is the smart enough Nerf gun. We're gonna stop for a, a, a five minute break I do have a separate presentation. I'm, I'm thinking that uh, when I'm sharing, I might have to make sure I can't, I'm not sharing a screen, so I can't just drag it into place, but um, we'll do that shortly. Uh, but this is a student project and I, and I brought it up because actually that same hardware or framework um, that was used in the factory can be used virtually unchanged into some IOT device. And this is, I th would suggest IoT sort of taken to the extreme, and the 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 sort of the the, the basis for this is essentially to to really just uh, IoT the uh, the heck out of this Nerf gun uh, to create some sort of user experience. What can you do in a in a restricted confined space uh, with low cost and low power, and uh, and what can you do? So this is the, uh, you know, wireless sensor network that's going to work in a harsh environment and be portable. 
So the students built in a, a number of things. They built in uh, some optics here to, to work out the, the speed of the bullet. They used um, an OLED screen to show the direction that they were facing, and also potentially the the attitude of the of the of the Nerf gun, whether it was aimed or not. They could use the an RFID to authenticate the user and also test what magazine capacity it had. And they also used um, essentially the, the, the board here, which was the brains of the system, um, had the XB on it, used a Teensy controller, had a connection for a GPS, and this inertial measurement unit. But on the right hand side is this stack. So this is this framework that was used. Now, the difference is that they used the Mong MongoDB rather than Postgres, but essentially everything else was just the same. So a layer, an application layer with an MQTC server, there was an external gateway, they used uh, ASO2 15.4 communication, and they used uh, uh, this, this uh, concept of the, the RF modules here to talk between these Nerf guns and to like a centralized sort of player sort of system. Why have I brought that up? Well, I brought it up because it becomes to talk about IIoT, the Industrial Internet of Things. And this is a quote from the Process and Control Engineering Journal, or PACE, from June and July 2019. So just last, well, uh, two years ago now. Um, and talking about the Industrial Internet of Things, this chap, Manny Romero, said that it's changing the control system environment. And he actually made the point that it wasn't the same as Industry 4.0. Now, it's an interesting one there, but let's just, let, just, just, let's just live with that. That's fine. It's definitely not the same as Industry 4.0, but you know whether Industry 4.0 is a subset of the uh, Industrial Internet of Things, I'm not sure, or whether it's vice versa. But he focused that, and this is perhaps the answer, it's around about the SCADA layer. And he defines what you can do now as SCADA for the masses. And his point was that anyone, and these are, uh, this I should have actually maybe put those in quotes, but anyone has the means to design and build a control system, regardless of technical knowledge and experience. And essentially, that's what I wanted to show here in the in the design of both the Smarty Nerf gun and the factory in a box. And this is this is what the the <laughs> well, we're continually testing that theory, but the concept is that anyone now has the means to design and build a control system, regardless of technical knowledge and experience. And what he highlights is that SCADA, uh, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition Systems, DCS, Distributed Control Systems, and PLCs are all closed systems. And that's perfectly true. And the IIoT is open. And although the module here is not open source, the tools to manipulate and manage it are free. And all of these things in here, Node-RED, Node.js, the MQTT protocol itself is not, doesn't cost. The MongoDB can be, it's an open source database, I'm pretty sure. Um, all of these things, go to this open standard of IOT being open. And he calls it a battery powered and wireless revolution. And I would completely agree with him. And this is an example of the wireless and battery powered revolution. And it's a lot prettier than my factory in a box. But <laughs> that's the other thing as well. I just want to highlight this one as well. Just, uh, just we'll just go to the next slide. It was extraordinarily engaging. This is the RMIT students that that built this system. They built many, many of these Nerf guns, incorporated the same devices into the Nerf gun. Um, you might see one or two of them wearing sort of, uh, uh, I don't think we can tell there whether they're wearing their RFIDs on their wrists or not. But essentially it was very engaging both for them and for the people uh, looking around. So, so what you can see are a lot of students uh, at 
final year of, of school, um, going around to this uh, uh, engineering uh, presentation that the students did um, in a place called Jeff's Shed, and uh, and it was very engaging. So it's so in, in in a sense the Nerf gun is more than just the toy that gives you a better toy experience. It's actually a fun way of engaging young people to look at um, to improve STEM capacity building. So in terms of the things that it, it it did, it allowed people to work on design with constraint requirements, with a limited power and limited budget. They did their own PCB design, their own 3D printing, and their own cabling. So it involved uh, software, hardware coding, configuration, and integration. So the whole kit and caboodle. And we used the uh, they used the Smart Enough Factory as a starting point to understand the sort of the framework and what the capability of these devices were because this module is actually quite capable in its own right um, to use as a platform. So when we have something like this, this is where we start to have opinions. We have opinions about these, these, these frameworks and that's what I wanted to sort of highlight that this is, you know, that's where we talked about frameworks. We set a framework, it means that that framework can be taken and adapted to do a factory or a Nerf gun. And that the, the actual, interestingly, a lot of the hardware, a lot of the things you want to do are quite similar in both cases. So um, we can talk about the, the simulators and DAC nodes, but what I want to do now is this is a nice point to take a break. So I'd like to make a, a five minute break. If I, uh, let's see, can I do a stop share? I do have a break slide, but I'm not sure that's gonna actually uh, come up if I do a presentation slideshow from current slide. I think it doesn't stop, doesn't stop that one there. That's it. So uh, I will change my share. And we will take a short break. Hey, so yes. Um, sorry, before you leave, there is a question uh, from Professor Prinja. Has the factory in a box been used for predictive maintenance? Has it been used for predictive maintenance? That's a good question. Um, no, we haven't used it for predictive maintenance, but it could be used to help with predictive maintenance in a sense that um, we can either log, which we do, we log the times that the machines have been run for. Um, and potentially, um, if you can tell, you can tell if the, if the downtime is excessive on a machine, you can say, well, okay, look, that machine looks as if it's, uh, if it, if it, if something's going wrong and we're looking at the outputs. Um, Often predictive maintenance, people talk about predictive maintenance in terms of vibration analysis. Now, if you're looking at vibration, that's actually a bit too late down the, down the line. Um, uh, so there are more complex systems for, for, for that, that, that do actually look at oil quality, for example, on an ongoing basis and actually can report those things. But uh, the integration to a, a CMMS would be something simple in terms of, uh, in terms of just logging uh, of timings in this smart enough approach. Hopefully that's answered your question. Well, perhaps Professor Pringer can come back on that, Steve, and uh, you can answer him again uh, later. Yeah. Great, okay. Thank, thanks, Steve. <clears throat> right. See you in five. Yes, I'm gonna just stop my video and I'll just go and Grab another drink. I shall just, uh, yeah, my video's back on. Okay, I'm sh I'll stop. Okay, so this is where we where we stopped. Now, um, I'm going to quickly go through this and get to the demonstration. 
Um, but essentially, this is just a close up of the DAC nodes that we had. We can sort of see where we have DAC, DAQ, standing for data acquisition. And essentially, these are the devices that, where well, we talked a little bit about this input buffer and output buffer, the concept of a light tower, that these are machines, they break down. The interesting thing is that they break down, they take time to fix and, uh, and respond to alarms and warnings, they run out of work. So the point is these are discrete event simulators and that allows us to, to then do something for that. Now they actually themselves are built around this uh, using a Yakindu state chart tool, which is a, a graphical way of doing state charts and that could even be involved um, into teaching state chart programming. And, and now to get to what's inside or behind the, the scenes, um, it's node red, essentially the dashboard there's a database Postgres um, and node red here and node red is controlled using these, these nodes, these, this visual flow where data flows through those wires uh, from sort of left to right and from top to bottom. And the data as it goes through this stream as is, is worked on and, and changed until finally something happens to it at the other end. And it uses this visual programming tool. And what it means is that to use it, we do need to have some limited JavaScript in order to do it. So it's not completely no code, it's low code. But again, most of it's around configuration and we'll see that very, very shortly. Um, now, we do need to talk a little bit about our bits. We, we keep wanting to do that. We keep saying, how what can we do with bits of information? Well, of course, we're talking about binary digits. One bit can represent two states off and on, two bits, four states, and they might all four have meaning or they might not all four have meaning. And there are three meaningful ones below. We'll see that in a second. And then we have three bits. You start to look at, well, with three bits, you can express the numbers zero to seven in binary. So that means there's eight different states. Um, but that would start to mean that we need to encode that data but they aren't directly necessarily, those eight states aren't necessarily related to uh, a piece of equipment. Whereas when we have two bits and one bit, we sort of still are having that physical relationship. And those physical relationships, as we can see here in this top one here, if we're, if, whoops, if it's dependent, um, then we can actually give them meaning. So for example, we have two bits of information, a most significant bit and a least significant bit. The most significant bit is perhaps going to do a button, which might be labeled off and on. And the least significant bit might be associated with an actuator, which is in or out. Now, interestingly, we can maybe combine those two states to give meaning. So this state means stopped. And this also means stopped. For example, if that was a, you know, it's, it's when the machine's off or the in some operational cycle where this represents off, then whether the actuator is in or out is still represented by a stopped signal. And then we might have other states like when it's on um, and the actuator is in, it's idle. When it's out, it's busy, for example. We might also have independent bits where the, the combination is irrelevant. So it might be an alarm and an actuator. And then the state of the machine is, is well, the alarm's off, but it's idle. The alarm's off, but it's busy. It's on, but it's idle and it's on. And the alarm's on, but it's also busy and idle. So in that respect, we need to decode this. And that coding and decoding and mapping to, 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 to states has to happen somewhere. And that's usually either in Node-RED in our case, in our stack, or in the database in terms of triggers and what have you. But it has to happen somewhere. Um, now, this is where, again, um, it would work interactively, but uh, I'm gonna take the place of the interactiveness, <laughs> which I apologize for. Um, but when we talked about how many, what can you do with one bit? Now, this is where we can start to sort of see that. Um, we're talking about a very simple square wave, but of course the, the width of the on time and the width of the op time can change and they start to mean things. So it, we can sort of see that what we've highlighted here in, in, uh, on this 
overlaid on this red trace here, uh, which is the signal going from zero, these transitioning from zero to one, and, and they're transitioning from one to zero, that between the upwards transitions, we have a con this arrow here, and the same with the downwards ones, and equally that can relate to perhaps a cycle time, the period, and can be a, a, call it a cycle time. And the periods when it's high, we can call that maybe a busy time, and when it's low, and call it an idle time. It's just equivalent. You know, they don't have to be equal widths. It might be that there we also invert the logic, but essentially, you know, from this point to this point is a cycle still, um, and this represents some sort of uh, busy period, and this represents some idle period, or vice versa, depending on the machine. Then we can see that on this top trace that we have a point where you know, there's a larger gap between cycles. So perhaps this right represents an unplanned stop, as you can see in the green, the green one here. Uh, when it starts again, it might start on a different product, and that has definitely a shorter cycle time. And then later on, there's another stoppage. In order to highlight them as stoppages, we, we need to have some sort of time limit, which is represented by these dashed lines. But the reason for adding all these features is that we don't know what the machine is doing. All we're getting from the machine are just these change in bit states. So we, just like a doctor would listen to your heart, we are listening to the heartbeat of a machine and we are applying all those actions, like you know what, what these things mean in our software, because we don't wanna be digging around in legacy systems or in old systems and reprogramming them to give us the outputs. We can actually, we can actually derive these things from the state from, from the state of the machine. We can also do lots of other things. So once we've got these counts, we can look at the rates at which things happen. We can look at totals. We can look at percentages and we can look at averages. So the point is that from one single bit of information, provided we know the time that that occurred, we can relate that to perhaps the shift start time and the shift end time. And then the, the, the events that occurred, the cycles that occurred within that shift time, we can add them up. So you can see how we start to build up that dashboard from this very simple bit of info, bit, this single bit of information. So we, like I say, time the periods, time the states. So we might find that we want to add up the, or, or, or understand the busy time not just the idle time, for example, or whatever we want to call them. Um, but sometimes we don't, we just want to look at the cycle time. And once we just, if we do that and we store just the cycle time, of course, we can no longer work out from that. We can no longer get back to this concept that cycle is, a, is busy plus idle. We've changed the granularity of the data that we're collecting, but that's fine often to do that. We can compare this to a time reference, we can compare anything to a reference, in fact. And of course, uh, we can highlight important state changes. So the last thing that occurred or, or the last thing that occurred here, they can all be recorded. Um, if we have two bits of information, we start to have maybe a more complicated looking diagram. Um, and it might be that in a particular process that we're just interested in terms of utilization as look, for looking at this period here this on state here and the events on top, we maybe just want to count them. We don't necessarily need to know how long they took because they might only last a second or two or maybe a fraction of a second, but it really depends on the, on the system. But we've got examples of that and we've seen examples of that all the time in this thing, but somewhere or other to determine what we want to do, whether we want to count this part as a cycle and of course add up these non-cycle things as the non-utilized part of the machine or count these if you want to count these as well then we have to add some logic and again the logic can be in the database or it could be a node red but there needs to be logic somewhere and getting logic from a relay contact this is a real world example in fact the relay is just over my shoulder um when we have no signal and we have, we're, we're dealing with electrical signals that are quite noisy. Um, what we're seeing here actually is a, is a signal, a voltage signal, whoops, a voltage signal from 
a uh, relay contact that is grounded. So this is the these in these are the time. Well, it's, it's about ten milliseconds, I think, maybe a bit more, fourteen. Um, but that's over a, a relatively long period of time in computer terms for this signal to settle down from going to this high level to this low level. And what happens is that the switch bounces. So this is switch bounce. And as this switch bounces on and off, we get these spurious counts. We don't account those. If we look at, for example, just adding a simple low pass filter, we see that the low pass filter smooths out the all this signal and eventually it decays down until it transitions to a point where it actually trips from a high logic level to a low logic level. Um, I'm going to move on quickly. The Sutton Tools journey, we've done a little bit of this as well. It's all about business process re-engineering. And what it meant was that we went on a journey from a collaboration tools to integration to digitalization. And then it turns out that, in, that once we've done this journey uh, and we've added IoT, that this concept of compliance and productivity, which I've been talking about, actually emerges from this digitization activity. So we're going to actually see this string. And I think I covered this in the first, the first uh, presentation in December. We're going to see this MQTT payload in action. And just to remind ourselves that it's, the, it's an array notation. It's about our sensors. They have an address. They have some data. And they have a timestamp. And that's our data, and it represents, just as I've been talking about here, perhaps we can use the second bit as a mask, so it's a machine state, and they ignore the machine state, or it could be flipped over depending which is our most significant or least significant bit. Our model was a switch. Now, it enables us to do all of these things with the dashboard. So now, I'm going to swap cameras, and I'm going to do a demonstration. I'm going to swap cameras and also swap what I'm sharing and just bear with me a second. So I'm going to change this, change the, uh, the camera and we'll see our kettle. So hopefully that's going to be big enough for us to sort of work out what's going on. I'll try and point things out. I'll move the kettle out of the way shortly, but this is what we're going to look at our demo. So let's just change what I'm sharing now. Uh, I think if you clicked on the, the screen, you could actually make the screen larger and the presentation smaller. But let me swap to a browser window. And I'll do that now. Okay, so what we've got now is you're looking at my browser and we're looking at the the editing end of Node Red. And we'll see that if I if I do this, I put all that data in the bin and I go over here and I move the kettle. In fact, if I move the kettle, as soon as I move the kettle, now that's uh, that's a, a spurious error. So I've not done another setup, but essentially I lift the kettle off the base and now I had this string reported. And it's this little box here, my factory, my cell, my machine, here is a message payload. And it came from this, if you notice that when I highlight that node, it came from the debug node on here. So I will do again i will pretend that i put the kettle on the base i get a one zero i turn the kettle on i get a one one so that's the kettle base i took my finger off and we got a zero here this null here is from this this error is from postgres because the data that's stored in the uh in the in the database the there isn't an entry for the kettle in that in that database Node Red, and it's a quick dive into Node Red. That's what you're seeing. So let's see what's on the what's on the table. So on the table, now I've moved the kettle out of the way. Is a kettle base that is connected 
to the factory in a box. So what I did, rather than show you the vanilla factory in a box here, you can see there are no hardware, there's no hardware on here. It's all taken apart. So this is actually deployed. So on the table we've got at the back here, a PLC. And this is definitely a legacy type PLC. This has lost no support for the last 20 years at least. Uh, and this PLC has a very, very simple program. I'll start it operating. One switch to turn it on. So it's now on. In fact, we maybe saw that if we looked at our screen, we, we saw that this one down here we had from 8AAC, we had data as one zero. Now I'll just, I'll just show everyone that this is actually a timestamp and it happens to be Zulu time, uh, 740, uh, sorry, 10.07, oh, 10.07. That's gonna be uh, UK time now, I think, isn't it? If you're a winter time or your summer time, might be a nine or I don't know. It's close. <laughs> you can tell me later. All right, but the point is that this PLC and that action there when I turned it on provoked that, that sign. I'll actually start the, 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 the device working now. So now it will cycle every four or so seconds. It will cycle. So now we end up with a stream of data from this process. We've got a kettle here doing the same thing. So every time the kettle, an event occurs on the kettle, that's it. So let's now see what's going on. We can we can show you as well that on the table next to the PLC to the left. And the right are two RFID detectors. And behind here, this, this is a the Raspberry Pi, this is our edge computer. So this USB power supply here has just been used as a power supply for each of these things. It's not, there's no data going through there. The data is purely coming by wireless. Um, and we have a number of RFID tags. We have a I'll move my microphone. Hopefully that wasn't too awkward for everyone not hearing me very well. Um, but um, we've got RFIDs and they will register uh, either the, the IDs of these cards as we go. Um, and uh, essentially, I just want to show you there's a node here that can be used, um, you know, it could be used with a battery powered, for example. Um, we can use a similar device uh, to look directly at 24 volt sensors, for example, industrial sensors like this, for example, which is a proximity switch. We can also integrate commercial products like this uh, Ethernet enabled IO link from a company called Bailiff or Balaf. This can be integrated into Node Red and we can use either the IO link devices with it or any non IO link sensor, PNP type sensor, for example, like this proximity switch. But essentially what I'm trying to show you is that um, uh, you know, we're looking at interfacing between sort of hardware uh, and software, essentially, and that the, the hardware is not restricted to to anything in particular. So let's look at what actually that that means. And I've got a very, very simple dashboard uh, that we can look at. And then we look at uh, Node Red. Let's go to the dashboard. Let's see the dashboard here. Uh, and we'll see that as we've been working, uh, there's some instantaneous statuses of the two machines. Uh, simply pressing, I'll stop this one. It's now idle. These are event driven, so I won't see any more events occur until the next event occurs. So I can make it either busy. You can see the larger pause there. I can turn it off and it's now idle. And the other one, the other graph, we can see the tail end of the kettle. Now, for example, we might put the kettle on the base. 
then we might put the switch down at some point. Uh, at some point in the future, kettle boils. And then at some point we take the kettle off the base. And then we wait, there's a delay. And then kettle goes on the base again, switch goes down this time, boils a bit quicker, and we take it off the base a lot faster. So we end up with these sort of features that we can visualize what's going on with the machines and we can see what's happening with their statuses here. Now there is an, an RFID of zero there. That's very interesting. Let's see if we can see if we put an RFID tag in here. Well, okay. Nothing changed. So this is a very, very quick <laughs> overview of Node Red. Okay. So what's happening with Node Red is that is that in Node Red we are using the XB ID now, depending on how quickly, sorry, the XBs, I should say, uh, it says this is listening. So depending on how quickly our screens update, I don't know whether you'll see every time I uh, say tap this card here, you'll see that listening changes to receiving data. And if we look at the debug messages that we had before, just clear those. And if I use an RFID tag, We'll see that now we see that instead of having a message that had um, just one, you know, basically zero, one, zero, one, one, we now have a, a, some data. And that data is a string representing the RFID tag, again, the timestamp. So let's just disable that one for now clear that and let's just see what the the payload is from the from the, from the uh from the xb well so from the xb we actually have the data buried inside this object here from this from this node here the remote 16 is clear that's the that's the idea of the uh of the xb that's how, and then this is the data in the buffer now this is as, a, as three, or oh, sorry, as four bytes. It's our, our byte that represents uh, the, um, the ID of the card. So starting with the XB, and this is what I want to highlight about this system. I'm not gonna teach you it in this time. I'm just gonna show you that it's configuration over, over customization. So essentially, we actually, all we have to do essentially is fill in the blanks. And when we fill in the blanks and deploy this, then that is actually it. We change a couple of rules. We use, uh, this is the way that we use our system and we program this. This is, this is actually Jason Arter. This is the programming language that we use in order to separate where well, we're filtering and we're changing or mapping data and filtering it so that we create new uh, new data. Uh, so this data that we're creating is going to be, in this case, the payload, sorry, the topic. And we're going to call it my factory, my cell, my machine. If it's from a machine, or we're going to call, so call it my factory, my cell, my RFID reader, if it's an RFID um, device. And if it's neither of those two, we'll give it some other name, my factory, my cell. So that's how we do this. So we change the topic and the payload and, uh, and that allows us to create a payload and the payload that we created, remember that square bracket? This is how we do it. We start off with a square bracket here and uh, we, we actually put our remote 16 in here. And if it happens to be this type 131 <clears throat> we then put the payload in <clears throat> and the data and the digital samples and we put millis this this expression here millis which you can see there it popped up it returns a millisecond since the epoch and since the unix epoch <clears throat> as a number and that's it so that popped that up there uh, we're using an internal function so that so in a few lines of code we can create our payload. 
and this this payload is an interesting payload. Um, if I was to give it to somebody, this is essentially what when we talk about interfaces that that, that payload is a simple structure that uh, this device outputs and another device has to be the same one in this particular case then consumes. So that idea of having um, an interface, creating a new interface, this RF, this um, this uh, MQTT message allows us to then distribute these things so that one thing can be can be publishing and another system can subscribe. And not just one thing can publish, <clears throat> as long as the format of this is in this way, different things can publish it, different technologies can publish it, different, uh, completely different systems. This bailiff system behind me could publish an MQTT payload in this format, and then the same system could consume it later downstream. So again, this is going to be awkward in a sense that I'm not expecting you to sort of understand it, but just to get a flavor of this and then 15 lines of code where one's a, where two lines of comments, uh, we can actually create this MQTC message and topic. Just so happens that um, the kettle works on negative logic. So how would we flip this negative to positive logic? Well, we have to separate the messages. And we do that by looking at the device. So if we have, if the payload zero, which is the reference to the, the array, if it contains nothing, sorry, if it contains E262, in fact, let's, let's, let's make an E262 uh, payload so we can see. So let's, let's have that on the, on the right. So that's E262, two things happened. <clears throat> what happened here was that if it found that string inside that particular spot, which is this first part here, this array, so array zero is E262. If it found that, then that's directed towards this line here. And in this line, we invert the data bits. So we have another bit of code. But if it's a zero, it turns it to a one one. And if it's a one, it turns it to a one zero. Otherwise, it's a zero. So that's how we create our levels, how we invert our logic. Because um, for reasons that I'm not going to explain here, um, the switched ones, we tend to use negative logic. Well, OK, very simple. So you can tell whether it's, it's disconnected or whether it's actually off, potentially, if you've got separate systems. And um, whereas the uh, data from the uh, uh, the PLC is actually just standard sort of positive logic. And then it's published as an MQTT stream. Now, MQTT is the interesting bit. And I'll spend a little bit of time on this one. And what it does is it uses a, a separate MQTT server. Now, typically, we'd use the address of the server. But because we're running in Docker, we can actually use the name of the server. And, then, and the, so it's the name of the server is the network address, the internal one and its port is 1883. Again, we can we can set up that one. Now, the other thing that's that's interesting here is that with MQTT, we can set some level of security, but we can also set some specific messages. And MQTT has a birth message and actually has basically a last will and testament too. So, and the reason for those is that we can actually set what the what those connection messages are um, if it closes nicely we can send one and if it unexpectedly closes we can send one as well and the reason for that is that the broker can be separate from the publisher system whereas in our case the reason why they're blank is that the broker and the publisher and the subscriber are actually on the same system. But if they're separated, then the broker can recognize that the publisher has disappeared and send a message that the a subscriber can use to understand or know that that expect that it's that that disconnection has occurred. So that's where, where that's quite useful. So MQTT topic based 
and my topic is my factory, my cell, my machine, and the, and the reference to the XB itself. And then I subscribe, to, I can subscribe to that later. So what we've seen as a publisher so far, and we've seen that that's what we need to do to, to, to connect it. So potentially we could, the data comes in from the XB, there's a, there's, a, there's a change to that original structure to create a more compact structure. We do some logic changing if we need to. If it's not needed to change, we go through to the publisher here. And that, that is down here on the left. So we simply drag things from the, from the nodes on the left-hand side onto our editor. And if we're paying attention, we realize that I'm working in a, a browser and our browser becomes the only thing we need to interact with the, the, uh, the system. So where does this page come from? Well, this page here, fireupdev.local, is, and I'll point to it without knocking anything, is here. So this is publishing this web page. So as well as running all the other things, part of Node Red is it has a web page. It's serving a web page, and that's how we're editing it. We're going through its edit. We're going through its its uh, its web page here. Now we can see there's a bright deploy here. We'll deploy that, and so that's all the changes. And all we did was move the position of this. Um, and now we would see potentially well what happens to the data. You know we've seen that we saw the the dashboard here. We saw this, so it's both of them are stopped. If I start again, we'll see that it disappeared for a bit because essentially we're, we're only looking at a few minutes here, 20, 20, 28, so four, uh, you know, there's a, there's a limited amount of time that we're sort of sh seeing on this, on this graph. I'll stop that because it's ticking away. Um, we still have this problem and perhaps we might try and fix that problem in the last few minutes. So how does that happen? So we publish here. Okay, here is a subscribe page. So this is a page that is simply represented or representing the, uh, uh, the dashboard that we're seeing. So the dashboard is set up. Oh, there's my dashboard. Dash, well, context data and let's look at the dashboard. The dashboard's here um, and this tab one, which we saw here, tab one, group one. Um, let's give it a bit more of an interesting name. We'll edit that, we'll call it sort of uh, my, my dashboard. Update and deploy and then now my dashboard is here. Again, the group's not very, not very well, well titled. We can change that, but but essentially, the data comes in here. So this this is a subscriber. We subscribe to a topic. This one subscribes to a different topic. We then set the message payload. We strip out all of the information that we want from that one, and that is purely to to allow us to display that on this graph here. We're really only looking at, at putting the, the, uh, uh, the data here. So to put that data here, the graph, all the graph needs is the message.topic. Sorry, the message dot, uh, where is it? The, uh, down here, legend name XB. Sorry, that's a chart node, it's line data. Um, it just needs the message.payload app. It tells me that here in the instructions that all it requires is the message dot payload will be converted to a number. So message dot payload comes in and it's just the payload in total, not, not any other things. We have to make the payload a single value and then that single value will then be plotted and that's it. Same with this one, the RFID is a piece of text and it again has a message payload here. But if we noticed it was zero, and the reason for that is if we work backwards, there's a transformation. So if we were paying attention on the dashboard, we saw that we weren't showing zero, one, two, three, or whatever. We were we were showing fractions. So we were scaling it. So if the payload was one one, 
we then said the payload was equal to one. If it was 10, we'd said it was equal to 0.3, otherwise zero. So that's why this particular graph, let me cancel out and show you that again, goes from zero to one and not zero, one, three, or zero, one, two, three. If we note that two doesn't come up, but anyway. But it did that to the RFID. So that's what's happened here. So unfortunately, the RFID data was treated just the same way and went through the same transformation. So here's what I wrote, wrote earlier, would be if it contains RFID, if the topic contains the word RFID or the letters RFID, we actually can redirect it. So let's now use this tool to put in between here and here, and we will transform the payload. Uh, let's see, that's machine data. So the machine data is transformed. But the RFID data is not transformed. So let's let's hopefully let's hopefully find that we'll now get the RFID information done there. So we'll deploy that. We'll go to our dashboard and we'll try and see if that's fixed us up. Now, of course, I should have checked this before I started because there could be other things going wrong, which there clearly is because we didn't quite get it. But there we go. That RFID data needs a little bit more work. <laughs> I think that's because we still get the uh, we still get the um, uh, let's see machine data goes to the transform the graph switch uh, oh well okay that's actually I think why because I don't actually have uh, if I do data should do all right okay what you do to troubleshoot is we're very simply put a debug on here and then deploy and see what this debug message said. Okay, we get the we get the array. Do we get the array? Topic. Did that one come from this one? Okay, from you. We didn't get that. We didn't get that output. Well, that's possibly why. So that one came from here and that one came from here. So yeah, that didn't work. But that's the only thing that didn't. I definitely should have checked. All right. OK, so let's go back to our presentation. I was giving you a very, 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 very rapid look at uh, at, um, at Node Red and trying to sort of give a bit of a flavor for, for using it, um, that we don't have to be super whiz -bam programmers. We just have to be able to uh, make some very, very sort of simple uh, changes to our data and manipulate our data around this concept of topic and payload in order to create a, uh, a usable graph and a usable dashboard. So um, let's share the, uh, let's go back to the presentation. And let's move on from that. Okay, we're eight thirty, so we're we're about ready to stop. So, the factory in a box really gives us sort of opportunities. Um, the core mantra of it is to to look at low cost digitalization or bust. Um, it's a built around the smart of principle, and they're tools that have been picked that lower this barrier. The the barriers have, we've identified a cost. Well, it's not just we've identified, but most people identify as cost, the complexity, the STEM requirements that you need, and the security requirements. And in this case, security for us is we're looking at not creating sort of automatic systems and closed loops. And if that's the, if the security of the system was breached, potentially there's no access to the to the network to the company. Um, and we have highlighted that Architect have actually mapped out this journey uh, because of this failure to fire of Industry 4.0 in, in, in Germany to sort of our stages of industry 4.0, our digitalization, 
stages and our visualization stages that we want to, want to seize upon. So final thoughts. Um, if you believe the model that Industry 4.0 is increasingly complex, digital transformation of Industry 3, then hopefully I've, try, I've been able to change your mind. Um, we, we, we first off explored why this viewpoint exists and we proposed a, the, the factory as an alternative approach to digitalization. And uh, this smart enough concept um, could get you on a, on a journey. Um, and we've got, I've, I've tried to show you my first hand experience of extracting data from legacy machines. And I've sort of talked about sort of the highlights and I've, I've maybe skipped over some of the low lights, but there are low lights, of course, in doing it yourself. And, uh, and show what it takes to get value from your data. So again, I'd just like to thank you. Um, I, again, just acknowledge all the partners in the, in the processes that we've done and the uh, capstone students that we've been involved with um, and also the friends and colleagues at RMIT and certain tools and all the work integrated learning students. So perhaps I should change my video camera back to me. There we go. And um, and thank you for your attention. Thank, thanks, Steve. Um, there are a, a few a few comments. Really great and a lot to take in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there was a lot. There is a lot to take in. And I yeah. think that's the, that's the that's when you start to get to the details, it it starts to be, you know, very. And, and again, that's a little bit why I sort of highlighted that that quote from uh, from from Wikipedia that it might contain too much detail for some people, but. I want to show you at least where where you have to go to that you need to you need to get to that detail in the end. Yeah, but the good news is that all three presentations will be available on the network website, and um, you know so people can can view them again. And if they have any questions, they can uh, drop an email either to you or to us, either Pamela or myself, to with questions. I mean, maybe we'll have a follow-up presentation, you know, if there are some particular questions that uh, that people have. Um, and certainly Professor Pringe has had to go, but he says he's going to contact you directly by email. And uh, Shay Cameron's made some comments uh, about some work he did in his uh, PhD. Uh -huh. uh, so, you know, I don't know if you can see the comments on, on uh, it. But I'm looking for the for the comment section. I think I should be able to see the comments, um, but I haven't got them out of the chat yet. I, I had the I had the I had the comments closed. I'm, I'm, I apologise to everyone who's been watching that I I actually. Yeah. Uh, no, that's yeah. okay. Um, but Shay asks, have you engaged with any industrial partners? Encourage them to build their own own flows. Yes, and we have. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, the the um, the or oh, uh, oh, in fact, Shay's quite correct i've just noticed the last comment but yes we've engaged with companies in queensland and we're about to do the same with uh, with companies in in victoria well and one in victoria uh, but a, a broader victorian one um the comment that shay did exactly the uh, the the formatting of the dashboard is quite limiting um uh there are uh, oh look i wouldn't say it's strange to resist uh, the the it, it, you are able to use uh other uh JavaScript libraries for for graphs. We, I didn't show that, but the graphs that we use in the in the live system are JavaScript libraries. Um, you can also use things like Grafana and other tools for dashboarding. But the uh, uh, but the other thing you can use Node Red for, which is something that uh, that's also quite useful, is just as middleware. You don't have to look at the dashboard from Node Red. Node Red's great at sort of transforming and processing, and 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 working on data. And then having something else pr present the data, so um, it's one thing to try and do it like this in the factory in a box concept is to try and keep things sort of pure and not and not necessarily complicate it with too many uh, tools. Um, trying to get to the minimum sort of tool set that can sort of show off the example. So yeah, it's actually um, uh, yeah, it's it's actually quite quite interesting to try and do all that in in a, in a limited way um but yes it, it, it is it is there as a, as a as a tool to help you learn and then as a stepping as a stepping stone and there are other plugins of course that you can use to to, to do better with uh, and improving there mm -hmm. so 
Yeah, there's another question there from Bo Yang Song. Okay. Uh, uh, have you seen any measurement directly correlate I industry 4.0 to manufacturing KPI utilized? Uh, yes. Um, yeah. Uh, KPI uh, well, utilization. I mean, I didn't show that screen. Uh, the screen that you looked at there was a screen that was um, that, that the operators see. Um, the utilization information you can calculate it constantly, and that's something that the the supervisor or someone with access to the web based the web the web browser would we could look at. Um, so yeah, it's um, when you look at overall equipment effectiveness as well. That's another useful one where utilization or availability is combined with productivity and and what have you. Um, so yeah, the um, that's it. Um, yeah, so so hopefully Bo Yang, Bo Yang, let's see, any I4 narrative is, is there an I4 narrative is designed to speak to the manufacturing operation manager rather than speak to IT? Um, yeah, this, this, the, 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 the system that we've got at Sutton's and I, I should have started the VPN actually and shown you that. Um, but I think if you look at the other, other presentations, you'll see the other screens, but the, um, it is particularly operations focused and it is focused on information that's relevant to the supervisor and manager of the lines uh, as well as the operators as well so so yes it's 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 quite key to and in fact that the the board that that I showed with the with the vertical um, gauges um, is essentially taking the place of a of a of a of a, a whiteboard a factory visualization board that's sort of uh, that's a, a lean manufacturing board. So it's it it's it fits with lean manufacturing and it fits very well with within within a manufacturing environment. Um, yeah, I uh, hopefully that's covered what you were looking at as well there. Um, yeah, Shay just sort of thanked me for the answer and moving away. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank thanks, Steve. So we'll 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 leave it there. But I really would encourage everybody to communicate with us um, as to you know any any outstanding questions or any ideas they have for taking this forward. Is that okay, Steve? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah, yeah. The um, uh, uh, hopefully it wasn't too much of a shock to try and bring in the, the, uh, the real live demo, but yeah, it's, it's hard to sort of just dive in and show you. I could, I could have talked about something just in, in, in a lot, done it a lot slower. I think if I wanted to try and show you and teach you about node red, but, but I want to give you just a flavor of the, of the, of the tool set rather than anything else. Yeah. So I hope that works. I think Dave may have a question. Yeah. Well, it's more a comment. I think, I think for where we're looking, Alan, for the surface engineering industry, then it's this journey into using data is the key to it. I mean, what Steve's showing is if you have data, you can make decisions and you can do things in real time. But if you file the data in a lever arch file, then it's not much use to you. And I think one of the challenges, Steve, is the skill set in the factories to do the coding. That's that's exactly right, David. I think that's a very important point. And that's when I started off on this, I thought, well, potentially that's if we choose a, a tool that's 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 that has a minimal amount of coding, then potentially it's something that 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 a, the te a te someone at a technician level whose program PLCs can potentially do. Now. That's actually sometimes a bit of a stretch because it is different. Um, so what we've found in Australia is that um, we've we've often engaged, well, if, if, a, if a company has a resource that they want to put through some training program, then that works very well because they can, they can be quite engaged and they know the business and they can move on. But often there isn't the resource available to do that, even if it's a limited, you know, having to learn the new skills. So what we've done is look at work integrated learning students, which are final year, third year students at university who are, who are quite capable of using these tools and actually with the factory in a box itself, you know, learning it offline 
from the from the plant, but being able to go into a plant and actually help and set up and uh, and create a, a, a dashboard for a company or some sort of data store for a company. So that that that's that's where that short coming can be can be um can be can be um can be met you know that's that that the the concept that anyone can do it is actually <laughs> the more <laughs> the more we do it the, the less it's quite true but it's also a way of actually trying to show people what they need to know so it's also a way of of uh, of of highlighting you know the the sort of the that what were unknown unknowns into known unknowns you know and and yeah. so that allows people to then engage an integrator at the level that yeah. they need so 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 that's yes it's a very important point david yeah but i think the concept really goes back to that joiner triangle which will resonate with all businesses um, mm -hmm. i think alan trying to have a, a session with our industry partners where we talk around how do you create one data set? You know, the point you talk about trust in, in the, and truth in the data. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just having some pilot talent where we help people create digital sources of data. Yeah. Once you've got it, you can then build off that. But until you've got the data, it, it's relevant. It's you know, the factory in the box essentially uses data, doesn't it? That's exactly right. It's there as a data generator, and that's the difference. It, it's a way yeah. of, yeah, it's a, it's a way of creating new uh, information that, that, that can be then worked on. And then that's a, a metaphor for the factory or, or a simulation for the factory. Yeah, so, and I think, I think in the industry, Steve, I think there's no shortage of information and there's no shortage of tacit knowledge. But you can't do anything with any of that until you move it into a, a form where it can be used by people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think one of the journeys, Alan, might be to do some pilot little projects where using students either at Cranfield or in Manchester, as Steve says, these, are, these people don't care about the coding. It just works for them. Um, and, and just doing some simple pilots where showing the power of using data might actually be quite useful to to begin to take people on the journey. Right. It's, it's definitely not it's not a sprint, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, it's, yeah. it's definitely. And look, I think that's why it, lean manufacturing. It's it's a good a good um, you know. Um, not metaphor, but a, a good example of, of, of how this is, is to be applied. It's not something you just fit and forget or, or buy it out of a, and buy it and fit it. You know, it does require the company itself to, 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 to look at its own processes and, and to change itself, you know, and it's actually a, um, you know, a journey that they would undertake. Yeah. Um, so along those lines then, Steve, has anybody ever, or have you published information which at a high level shows the sorts of benefits a business can realize. I've seen some Deloitte type statements on efficiency gain through digitization and things like that. Um, but have you got any case studies which Alan could use, which essentially just paints a picture of the order of magnitude benefits? Because We've got yeah, look, that's actually that's an interesting one because if you just look at the, the the small part of the business, it's a bit like the same things on value that um, that that a lot of pilots where you look at the, the you know the, the the a big change to bottom line, you know, hard to sort of uh, hard to visualize, uh, hard to sort of do. But but the 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 activities that we've done with the Queensland companies have all been uh, they've all they've all then moved well moved on from what we've done with them to, to want sort of more. There's a couple that have used this as an example to, to build into their own systems where they've sort of, you know, they've seen the, 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 the simplicity and the practicality of it. And they've put, you know, put RFID into their, into their lines for looking at, you know, where, where things flow, um, which I, which I didn't actually click on to show you that, <laughs> that thing live, but there we go. Um, but the, 
in terms of case study, we've we've got some in, we've got some internal ones, but there all of this has been done through the uh, DNC um, uh, in um, ICD industry capability development. So the the, the studies have been not published in, in journals, but have been used uh, as resources to to government. So the, the data is actually, um, <laughs> it's not, I'm not sure how, well, we'll find out where, uh, later when it'll be published, but it'll be published by the government. Yeah. So the, the government will use those measures. So so we've measured, um, we've tried to look at KPIs of before and after, and that's also in short-term activities is also quite hard to do. But um, but yeah, that's to answer your question. Um, I don't think I've got anything that I can actually give you that's out of the studies that we've been doing because they're they're just wrapping up now, and um, and they're also it's it's sort of fairly uh, there's a bit of commercial uh, commercially sensitive information in them as well. Yeah, um, yeah. there's some but general stuff. Point, isn't... Yeah, but at, but at that point, Steve, it shows you it's still very much active research you know this this area is fruitful for getting involved in yes absolutely yes it is um uh, just to say that payman at sheffield has given an example of some work he's done on data analytics visualization mm -hmm. and um also uh beyond when well, you can see it yourself steve makes a comment yeah. about the dashboard I think, you know, and including what Dave's saying, this has stirred up a very interesting area of further work. And I'm sure we haven't finished here. I'm, you know, I think mm -hmm. it, uh, in, in many ways it's the beginning. And it's good that there are people who are, these people who are commenting or are doing, doing work in this area as well. That's, that's, that's right. Yes. There's a, there's a um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, um, a very rap well yes look it's 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 a very rapid and, and, and dashboarding visualization are the are the are almost the foundation sort of um uh, or the initial uh, activity that the that the, the company wants you know the visualization of data it's that first it's that first step in industry 4.0 and then it yeah. leads on to other things um the 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 there are the the tools that are available to do to create visualizations Many of them are open source. Many of them are um, just require t investing in time to, to understand how they work. Um, and some of them are the relatively straightforward to use like Node-RED, for example. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where I've drawn from all this, Steve, that you don't have to get into these complex PLM systems and all that good stuff. You, you can sit above all that and use open source information to that, actually to do it for yourself yeah yeah and that, and that quote from the from the manny guy from from uh the pace from the pace magazine on the, the pace sort of uh and just sort of control and, and whatever was very telling you know that was it was essentially calling it sort of um you know scada for the masses you know it's it's anyone can create a control system yeah. i think that's that was that was it with the tools that are available they aren't they aren't closed source they're open source and that you know whether you Think that's a good thing or not because there's a concept of a citizen developer which i didn't show much but that you know that that gartner defined the citizen developer a few years ago maybe maybe five or six years ago now maybe even a decade ago um to be honest uh, but the citizen developer was someone who could take up these tools and create sort of you know systems and software that was actually usable within a within a an, within a an organization that that could stand facing either the public or the in you know even intern internally or or even to the public yeah um, but, but, but i think it's this power of using data to drive your business forward and drive your productivity and your right first time and your compliance yes should resonate to all businesses mm -hmm. because no business has got a hundred percent yield no business has got 100% compliance and therefore there's waste which can be eliminated and therefore that's a bottom line benefit. Yep. Um, so, so I think there's a lot of food for thought there, Steve, but it, but it you know, if you plotted out the first time you, you did this stuff and the first version of factory in a box, what sort of timescales did that journey take you? Because it was a oh. discovery, wasn't it? 
Yeah, it was actually. And look, we did it over summers with with students. So I think the the well, it's 2016 was the first time we sort of um, did it. Um, but the the very very first device <laughs> that we've deployed, it's been it's been up and running for three three and a half years, I think, just sitting on on the floor. Um, the working. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's been something that we spotted as, as been able to do quite some time ago. And in fact, it was the, the initial activity was, was, was prompted by a, a device from a, from a, from a Australian telecommunications company, um, that was actually quite impractical to do. Yeah. Uh, it turned out it's closed source. We couldn't. We couldn't work it out. We we knew that we could do something in, with a with a, a Raspberry Pi, and we thought that the Pi version would be would take us longer, and wouldn't be as good as the outcome from the from the from the purchased one. But it turned out that the pain points for incorporating and getting the data into it were were almost the, were exactly the same. But the pain points were exaggerated by the fact that the closed source system was actually almost impossible to to for us to understand it required someone who was very much into machine to machine communications and not into general you know um just just having some basic computer knowledge yeah and if you put that in the context of certain tools as a business how, how old is certain tools it's 100 103 now <laughs> yeah so in 103 years certain tools has only used the last five years to begin to grapple with this issue yeah, uh, that, on the IoT side, but for the last te the last decade though, we have been working. We and that was I went over it quite quickly. That journey we started off with Confluence, and um, and we we used this an online tool as a knowledge store, and that's a, that's a, that's actually the digital twin of this of this factory in the box. We use the same tool, but it's a way of you know maintaining the sort of company knowledge. You know, I think I might have might have used the phrase. It's surprising how much we might have. Well, we've 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 definitely forgotten in that, that hundred years. Oh, yeah, um, I'm, yeah. I'm sure that's true. Yeah. yeah so essentially and, uh, your journey was confluence to essentially begin to capture knowledge. That's that's right. Um, that's a smart enough factory. I wonder if we've got the, uh, this, this, this confluence space. In fact, I think I'm still sharing the screen actually. Uh, yeah, that's, that's coming up now. That's, that's, that's the, that's a landing page to the confluence space. So the factory in the box is here. We've got um, my pretty face on there. We've got all the documentation uh, and and uh, and pages for. I think you're you showing know. a different screen, Steve. Am I? I th oh, do you know what? It's sat on top of the PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> the green border around the PowerPoint. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I just had the other one sat on top of it, so I just thought my border was there. So I apologise. Yeah. I can actually stop sharing that one, and then we yeah. get back to get back to the people there. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, we are, we are going to have to wrap it up at that point. Yeah, it's, I'm not surprised. It's uh, we've it's it's uh, yeah. We've yeah, got it's uh, almost midday here. Uh, what, what was it? What is it for you? Well, it's a bit earlier for me. It's just five to nine now. Uh, so, like I say, it was two hours difference from last time we spoke. Yeah. Okay. Oh so, yeah. A bit more user friendly. It was a bit more <laughs> user friendly. Absolutely. I'm, so yeah. Okay. okay I, I I will wrap it up because I know other people have got meetings. I certainly have got one coming up. So um, thanks again, uh, Steve. Uh, really, really, really excellent. And uh, you, you've managed to incorporate a huge amount of information actually across the three, the three talks. Uh, and they're there. I, I'll repeat myself again. They're there for people to go back to and watch. And then we can um, probably discuss also with Dave going forward. I think. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's uh, thank everybody for listening as well. Yeah, and it's nice to yeah. see you've moved on from Bible statistics. That was boring anyway. <laughs> oh, I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> but that was your entry looking at the statistics, wasn't it? Looking at, um, yeah, well, right. I remember you doing SCADA courses probably 30 years ago now at Hull. <laughs> Yeah, look, it's uh, that's interesting, and and, and that that's that has. Well, I'll, I'll quickly wrap up. But SCADA, the char you know, charging by the connection point, you know, that's that's why I think it's such a revolution in in IIoT. Talking about sort of SCADA and this existing 
closed systems, how that's changed and, and been disrupted significantly, um, you know, with, with these type of tools that, you know, it turns everyone into that citizen developer or uh, the, uh, gives them that ability, whether they choose to use it or not is another story. But yeah. Well, you have a nice evening, Steve. Bye now. Thank you. And uh, have a nice day over in the UK. And thank you. Look forward Thanks to for summer. And stay yeah. safe. Thank yeah. you. And Bye for now. <laughs>